Welcome everybody to my courtroom today. We're having a legal discussion. Uh, remember Alma was the first chief judge. So he thinks with that uh, legal mindset. So just for a little fun here, I thought we'd uh, enter a courtroom to do this. We're gonna discuss the Book of Mormon today, Alma, chapters five, six, and seven. So only three chapters, but as they all are, I guess, it's, they're really, really good ones. So if you'll go to Alma chapter five to begin with, you'll notice at the beginning, there's some words that are not italicized that says, the words which Alma, the high priest, according to the holy order of God, delivered to the people in their cities and villages throughout the land. Remember, that was in the original Book of Mormon. That's on the 1820 edition. Now, it's interesting that, remember, that we added uh, chapters and verses later on. They're not original to the gold plates. In fact, Alma in the first edition, uh, this chapter that we know as Alma 5 was actually Alma chapter 3 in the original 1830 edition of the Book of Mormon. But let's go back and to see here. Alma, remember, he was the chief judge, but he gave up the rights to be the chief judge in our last section that we talked about so he could focus on being the chief high priest to help people. We noticed that in chapter 5 here, that he is going to the capital city and he's going to start out. So let's take a look at some of the things that he's teaching us in chapter five here. If you'll go to verse, well, verse one, they're in, in uh, Zarahemla, the capital city. Verse three, first thing he does here is he states his authority. Where does he get this authority to do what he's doing? For example, when you're the chief judge, he stated the authority came by the voice of the people as Mosiah set up the, the system of judges. In this case, he said, I was consecrated by my father. That's the Alma the Younger, talking about his father, Alma the Elder, to be a high priest over the church of God. He having power and authority from God. So he's going straight to the source. That, that would be similar to Brigham Young saying, I receive my authority from the three witnesses who received it directly uh, with Joseph Smith from Peter, James, and John, and so forth. So great things there. Let's just go down to verses 3 through 13. And if you just scroll through, scroll through those, uh, when you read this in your personal study, he recounts history. Again, we've talked about this over and over. There's a power in knowing, learning, and understanding our history. How they were in bondage. And he says, I want you to remember that. Remember that. It'll bring you to a, a sense of humility to help you learn with what I'm going to teach you. But then verse 14, he starts in with this uh, discussion. And if you go back to verse 12, so we're in Alma 5, verse 12, and according to his faith, there was a mighty change wrought in his heart. Again, this is the history. This is the story that's happened before. And he's talking about there's a change going on here. But verse 14, and now behold, I ask you, my brethren of the church, have ye spiritually been born of God? Have ye received this image in your countenance? Have ye experienced this mighty change in your hearts? I really want you to think of this as a courtroom where you're having a, a lawyer uh, ask you questions like you're on the witness stand. In this case, you are asking yourself these questions. You can't lie because you can't lie to God. And can you lie to yourself? I think some of us try to sometimes. Like, this won't hurt me when we know in reality it will. So it, let's take a look at a few other things here. There, uh, go down to verse, ah, there's so many good things here. In verse 15, do ye exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption raised in incorruption to stand? before God to be judged according to the deeds which have, have been done in the mortal body. Again, it's all about one judging oneself in the way that God will someday judge us. So kind of some fun stuff in there. Uh, verse 18, uh, some great things. Uh, have a remembrance of all your guilt, yea, a perfect remembrance of all your wickedness. In other words, do you remember these things? So as you study Alma chapter 5, I think I would encourage you to really ponder as if you're standing before the bar of God. In other words, you're going to face the Savior someday. 
these questions will be asked uh, maybe by you and you'll have to give an accounting, a witness, a, a testimony of the things that you've done. Verse 19, can you, excuse me, can ye look up to God at that day with a pure heart and clean hands? I say unto you, can you look up having the image of God engraven upon your countenances? Uh, there's some great things in there, so I hope you enjoy studying Alma 5. Uh, you can have some family discussions with this, but the real power is when you individually are on your knees asking yourself these questions. And you'll be taught. You might learn some things uh, that you should start doing. Uh, and Elder Clark taught this uh, a few years ago. You might also learn some things that you should stop doing. And between that process of starting and stopping, uh, we become changed. Uh, we become born again. So let's go to the discussion about being born again, because that's really what this whole thing is about. Uh, again, in verse 21, he talks about garments being washed white and purified and so forth. So let's go to, boy, there's so many good things in here. Uh, if we just scroll down, uh, verse 38 talks about calling you after his name, which we've discussed in previous weeks, being children of Christ, because we're born again. Some great things in there. Well, there's a couple other things. 46, how do you know if these things are true? How do you know if you've been born again? How do you know if you've changed? Uh, 46, down just a little bit. Behold, I have fasted and prayed many days that I might know these things of myself. Uh, love that. So let's talk about being born again here, because we've had this discussion a little bit in some previous weeks, but I want to get into a little bit more detail. Uh, when Nicodemus came to the Savior, uh, this is in John chapter 3, Nicodemus was asking the Savior, uh, and the Savior says, well, you must be born of the Spirit, and must be born of the water and of the Spirit. You must be born again, and Nicodemus was really confused. He even asked the does that mean I have to go inside of my mother's womb and be born again? Obviously, the Savior speaking uh, in, in symbolism in this case. So if you'll just take a, an account, if, this would be a good activity to do with uh, some of your older children. Make a list. Say, what's present in a physical birth? Well, there's a mother. Uh, there's a baby. Uh, there's blood. There's water. And there's a spirit. And you could go through, what are all of those items? It's the blood of the mother that gives life to that baby while it's in the womb. That baby is in a, a sack, we call it, uh, of water. And that fluid keeps that baby alive and so forth. And it's when that blood stops and between mother to child, there's blood that's spilt. The water is it is uh, given, and the spirit is at some time prior to birth inside of that body, which is the baby. All of those things are necessary to have a successful childbirth. Well, so the question goes, then what does it mean to be born again spiritually? Well, all of those same elements must be there. Well, what's the body? Well, it's me. I'm the body that's changing. I'm physically changing. And I don't know all the details, but when a baby is born, that baby changes. The heart changes. The blood no longer comes from mother. The heart changes, so it beats and circulates its own blood. The spirit of life is, is coming into the baby as it breathes. So when you're born again, there has to be some kind of a change. Well, what's the blood? Well, we know it's the blood of Jesus Christ. It was the blood that gives us life that rejuvenates our soul. What's the body? Well, again, it's me. What's the, the spirit? Well, we know the Holy Ghost is involved, and his spirit is promised to be with us always. What's the water? Well, it's the baptismal font. I physically get inside of that water to symbolize I'm going back inside of the womb, and when I come out again, it's as if that water were to break and I were to be born anew. So all of those elements of a, a birth are present at a rebirth, at a baptism. The question he asks, uh, Alma asks him again is, well, if you've been born again, can you say that you're born again now? In other words, can you be born again, again? And 
you and I who have done this many of times, we have been born again and again and again and again. Well, how do we do that? Well, we need to have a body, which we know the body is ours, partaking of the flesh of Jesus Christ. That's symbolic in the bread of the sacrament that we take. The blood is symbolized in many cases. It's again, it's the atonement of Jesus Christ that allows us to be born again. We partake of the water which symbolizes the blood of Jesus Christ, but that's, again, also the water that's present of the sacrament. And the Spirit, again, is promised to be with us, always His Spirit to be with us. So there's some beautiful symbolisms in there. You can have that discussion about uh, a baby being born, and as we get older, we're going to get baptized when we turn eight or when we're a, a, a true convert to the gospel of Jesus Christ at a later age. And then we talk about the rebirths that can take place after this. Alma is reviewing here with us all of that. And he says, have you been born again, again? And are you currently in a born again state to where this, the Savior is with us? So there's some great things in here. So 51, uh, again, Alma 5 verse 51. Yea, thus saith the Spirit, repent. All ye ends of the earth, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand. Yea, the Son of God cometh in his glory, in his might, majesty, power, and dominion. Yea, my beloved brethren, I say unto you that the Spirit saith, Behold the kingdom of, excuse me, behold the glory of the king of all the earth, and also the king of heaven shall very soon shine forth among all the children of men. And 51, except you repent, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And if you'll notice in verse 25, it talked about the kingdom of the devil. So if you're not born again, you're going in one direction. But to be born again, you get a, you're get you allowed and, and become more like the Savior to dwell in the kingdom of heaven. So there's some great things for you to study in Alma 5. It's a really personal and fabulous chapter to study. In Alma chapter 6... It's a short chapter. Alma just basically tells us that he leaves the capital city of Zarahemla. And he's going to go to a new city here in Gideon. So let's go straight to Alma chapter 7, which is where Alma enters the city of Gideon. And it's interesting, when he, when he walks in there, he says in verse 1 that he's going to teach them in his own language. I, I, I'm not sure what that means. Are there multiple languages going on here amongst the Nephites? I think sometimes we think they're speaking the same language that Lehi did. We're now 500 plus years since Lehi left. There's no way it's the same language. Now, there's been changes, alterations. I mean, we do not sound like they did when they wrote the King James Version of the Bible, which is 500 years ago, right? So, I mean, think about it. Christopher Columbus uh, landed in America just over 500 years ago. We do not speak the same uh, language and, and dialects and so forth. So, I'm curious if, if, he, if there are multiple languages going on in these different communities. Plus, they don't have the luxury of having national television and radio where they all can hear the same, the same uh, language and dialect and so forth. So if you go to verses 2 and 3, he talks about the, the judgment seat. Uh, he gave it to somebody else. It's interesting why he gave it, though. He mentions in here. It's because it was so busy. I, he says, I couldn't visit you when I was the chief judge. You know, you know we put on the robes, and you know, in, in the English society, they put on the powdered wigs. I, I don't know what Alma did, but he was so busy, he couldn't go out and visit his people. I think of President Nelson and our prophets and apostles. If they were political leaders as well as religious leaders, they just wouldn't be able to go out and visit the people of the world. And uh, what a privilege that is. They have in the past. Uh, done both, but currently they don't. So let's take a look at uh, what Zarahemla, the capital city's problem was in verse 6. And he's telling the people in Gideon this. It's towards the end of verse, well, in verse, end of verse 5, much afflictions and sorrow which I have had for the brethren of Zarahemla. Uh, in verse 6 he says, and behold, I trust that ye, the people in Gideon, are not in a state of so much unbelief as were your brethren. That, that's kind of the state of the capital of the Nephites when Alma's the chief judge and he gives up that, that chief judge uh, spot to be the high priest full time. So what is he going to do? He's going to do the most important thing. Verse 7, in the middle. There is one thing 
which is of more importance than they all. For behold, the time is not far distant that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. So he knows. He goes, you know what? We're short on time. We have to hurry. And he tells us in verse 8 that I'm not saying he's going to come in his mortal life here. He'll just be here on earth somewhere else. But we have to get ready for him. So think about that for a moment. Uh, are we in a similar time? Are we less uh, in Alma's day where we're less than 100 years from the, the coming of the Savior? Uh, and we need to prepare for that. What do we need to do? Verse 9, repent ye and prepare the way of the Lord. President Nelson has asked us to focus on gathering the house of Israel on both sides of the veil in uh, unprecedented pace. That's just remarkable. So if you go to verses 11 and 13, these are three of the most powerful verses on the atonement of Jesus Christ. So if you recall in chapter 7, he talks about you must be born again and again and again and have a personal evaluation with you and the Savior to be ready for when he comes. Verse 11 through 13 talk about how this is possible. It's the atonement of Jesus Christ. The atonement makes this all possible. You'll notice he talks that the, in these verses, it's more than just wash away your sins and overcome death. Read these and, and follow through. There's the four areas that the atonement will help us with. For a great conference talk just uh, in April, I think it was April of 2019, uh, Brother Tad Callister, who was then just released as the General Sunday School President, and he's a former 70, a uh, presidency of the 70, uh, Tad Callister's talk, he talks about those four things that the atonement does for us in that April 2019 uh, conference talk he gave. Wonderful talk. I would read that while I read this. I think there's a great power in that. And then our part is verses 14 and 15. What do we need to do? Verse 14, you must repent and be born again. What does that mean? And it gives us, be baptized unto repentance, that you may be washed from your sins, that you may have faith on the Lamb of God. Again, it's the doctrines of Christ. Faith, repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Ghost. 15, he gives a little more detail. Lay every sin aside, which doth easily beset you. And... Uh, just the word beset, again, we, we need to understand that word, how Joseph wrote it when he wrote it 200 years ago, or almost 200 years ago. Beset means to be troubled or threatens consistently. So sins that we are troublous or constantly with us, I just think that's a great word uh, to understand. We need to set those sins aside. And at the end of verse 15, Enter into a covenant with him to keep his commandments and witness it unto him this day by going into the waters of baptism. So if there's anyone here who has not been baptized by somebody who has the authority of Jesus Christ, I invite you, uh, witness that you will follow the Savior. Uh, a priest or an elder in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have the authority and power to baptize you to witness that you're willing to follow the Savior. And verse 21 is the focus of all of why. And he doth not dwell, we're talking about the Savior, in unholy temples, neither can filthiness or anything which is unclean be received into the kingdom of God. Therefore I say unto you, the time shall come, yea, and it shall be at the last day, that he who is filthy shall remain in his filthiness. We have to be washed clean. How do we do that? Baptism. And being born again and again and again. And then what is the final blessings? Well, if you go to verse 25, that ye, and, bless, and may the Lord bless you and keep your garments spotless, that ye may be, may at the last be, brought to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the holy prophets who have been ever since the world began. They're not in some righteous set that we can't obtain. He's telling them, you partake of these blessings. You keep these commandments, you be born again and washed away with, uh, washed your sins away with baptism by the proper authority. You will be able to sit down with Abraham and receive all of the blessings of the Abrahamic covenant. Again, blessings of the priesthood, blessings of an eternal family, blessings of an eternal pro uh, property, the celestial kingdom, Zion. Uh, I leave you my testimony that all of these blessings will be fulfilled if we just do these things. 
So that is Alma 5 through 7. Next week, the scripture block we will discuss will be Alma 8 through 12. Have a great week.